So welcome back in the cold. I think that if most of you move into the middle, I don't think it's that cold as on the sides, because there is sort of an air conditioning coming out. I think they were thinking of that it was still 30 degrees like last week, but it's not. So welcome back to this second half of the seminar. Uh, we have three commentators that will comment and reflect on what was said this uh, uh, before the uh, before the coffee break, and also the speakers are on the first row if they want to comment on the comments. Uh, the first speaker here today, or the first commentator, uh, I will pre present them all. It's Hans Ingvar Root, who is a professor of education at Stockholm University. He has written several books on minority rights and human rights, and you have just published a new book uh, in Swedish, is a religion and menslig rettighet, or is religion a human right? And here to my right is Lisa Pelling. She is a program director for migration at the Think Tank Global Challenge, that is one of the organizers uh, of this seminar today. And in the mid middle, we have uh, Rebecca Bolin. She is a writer and a journalist, and she has recently published this, this book that's called, in English, The Invisible, about the poor working class in Europe, and in Swedish, De osynliga om Europas fattiga arbetarklasser. It's also a book that I can really recommend. It's on interviews with many migrants all over Europe. But I will give the first uh, word to Hans Ingvar Ruth that you can reflect on. Is there anything in particular that you would comment on on this very first round? Thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting seminar. Um, I just want to make a general remark on the, uh, the high quality of the presentation. Uh, I learned a lot of uh, listening to the previous speakers. Uh, we have given a very uh, rich, new, rich and nuanced account of uh, the problems today. Uh, concerning uh, uh, migrants around the world. So uh, I don't have so much to say, or, or really nothing to say, uh, uh, criticizing their accounts. I think uh, very good, very interesting and challenging. Uh, so uh, uh, I, when I heard the uh, speeches, there are some things that I, I thought about, and uh, I think it would be interesting to hear uh, the answers uh, from the previous speakers. And um, just a short remark, a, br a brief remark on uh, uh, the human rights questions, and uh, why are human rights uh, so important in this uh, field? Um, I think, well, basically human rights, the purpose of human rights are to protect uh, people, their, their inherent human dignity. And uh, the, the human rights activists are very much focused upon people who are living in uh, vulnerable life conditions. And uh, many migrants belong to this group uh, in many striking ways. So. Uh, uh, and what we have uh, heard here today, uh, the problems are very, very serious. So, of course, there are uh, uh, there is a uh, very important reason in emphasizing uh, the human rights perspective in this context. Uh, uh, I, I, I also think it's interesting to reflect upon the UN Declaration on Human Rights uh, from 1948. As you remember, uh, maybe uh, there is an Article 13, uh, which is linked to these issues that we talk about today. Uh, and, uh, but there is no, right, there is no, or, no um, uh, statement in that article ab about the right to enter a state that is absent, so to speak. And 
also, when you read the 30 articles in the UN Declaration, you, you'll find that it's almost in every article it's presupposed that people belong to a country, so to speak. So, so the purpose of the uh, UN Declaration is more to secure fundamental rights and liberties for the people who are already uh, citizens. Um, so if one should write uh, the new a new UN declaration today almost uh, well how many, many uh, it was 1948 so it's over 60 years ago it was uh, uh, written and, and and accepted in the um, uh, general in in the general assembly of the united nations so uh, what would one include today how would uh, we would li like to describe this uh, 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 statement in or Article 13, for example. So th this is a, a question I would like to raise, uh, uh, to, because when you write these kind of instruments, you have to be very careful in uh, uh, the details, so to speak. And, and so that's one question to start with. <coughs> Also, one could ask here, be a little bit critical about uh, uh, right to migration. Uh, often we think that uh, migration uh, can be qualified and uh, uh, that the questions of human rights here are more about security, uh, poverty, etc. And one could ask how should a right to migration look like? It can't just be the right to move to any place you want, so to speak. Uh, the underlying purpose is, is to secure the life conditions, uh, uh, to, to find uh, better security and uh, avoid non-poverty, for example. So this is just a kind of uh, critical remark for, from me when, when one starts to reflect upon how to formulate an article like this. Uh, also, the, uh, something that tags on to this, of course, are what, how, where are the limits, so to speak, to uh, uh, have uh, uh, differentiation uh, uh, when people enter uh, countries, like uh, uh, given the different motives and, and aspirations to stay, one can't assume that everyone who enters a territory should have the same uh, right claim, rights claims, so to speak. So where are the limits of the differentiation here? Some people just want to stay for a short while. They may want to just uh, uh, avoid a serious conflict in their home country and they want to move back, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So what is realistic or feasible here and wh what are the ground floors, so to speak? And of course, we would like to uh, formulate that in terms of human rights. Uh, human rights are the ground floor. Uh, of uh, treatment, and that's why also it's so important to make a distinction between human rights and citizenship rights. Uh, citizenship's rights are much more substantial, they are much more cultural laden, uh, they're permitted by national culture and the aspirations of different nations to develop uh, a certain path economically, culturally, politically. But human rights are universal and should be applied everywhere, so to speak. I also want to, uh, the, the last thing I want to address is uh, uh, a very interesting question that was raised by one of the persons here in the audience. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I, you, you have not mentioned very much uh, questions of social tolerance or cultural tolerance in your speeches. We have, you have mainly focused upon uh, mate material welfare questions. Uh, of course, it's very important for a migrant to feel at home or feel at ease when you move to a new place. And uh, uh, here also the question of urbanization enters the scene, so to speak. That today we live in an urbanized world. More and more people want to live in the big uh, cosmopolitan cities. They don't want to live in small villages or small towns. That, why? Well, because 
research also very much uh, describe uh, uh, situation and give a very clear cut answer to that. And that's small villages, small towns are intolerant to a completely different degree. It's very difficult when you come from a different culture, different country, to move to a small town in Sweden, for example, where you have uh, uh, xenophobia, uh, prejudice, discrimination. People want to live in the big cities uh, because they hope that there you can find more tolerance and acceptance for your religious lifestyle or, or, or culture. So uh, I think you raised a very important question here. And, uh, I think also this is something we need to bring into the picture. It's not just a question uh, uh, when you talk about human rights and migration, just to formulate it in terms of material welfare. You also have to have this so-called cultural identity question more in focus. So I just want to ask you, the, the, the previous speakers, why didn't you uh, bring up this issue? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We will. Uh, the speakers may comment on the comments later on. <laughs> uh, the, but I will give you the word, Rebecca. You have just uh, published your book uh, a couple of months ago, and the, for you who haven't read the book, it's very much uh, the same as we've heard before. But it is about women, a lot of women who do the three C's uh, that we heard about before: the cleaning, the cooking, and the caring. What about your findings? Are, do, are they the same as the speakers, or is there anything else that you have found on, in your research that you would like to uh, comment upon? You can also you can use this one, yeah, in the middle. Okay. Yes, uh, I think uh, my job doing this book was uh, uh, in some way make a translation of because what what we're listening to here it's a quite high academic level. So it's for a lot of people very difficult to, to listen and to understand something about it. So what I do in my book, I uh, go to the working place and the homes of the migrant, the precarious workers, and talk to them. They tell about their story of their life, what they earn, what, how they live, their, their unprotected way of life. And I talk to the academics about the ana analysis of the situation. And I go to the trade union and sort of take pulse of the status of the trade union, because it's declining. The, the, the strength of the trade unions are declining. Not everywhere. I also find good examples that gives hope. Uh, so what someone said in the beginning of the <coughs> seminar, that uh, if the trade unions doesn't um, take on this challenge of the, uh, the, the, migra the migrants uh, having the lowest wages, being the precariat, that no, no rights, uh, they could possibly disappear within 10 years. Well, I don't think that will be true, that they will disappear, but they certainly need to take on this challenge. And, um, like we said here, that was said here in Sweden, one thing that has uh, affected is uh, the, the reforms by the so kind of neoliberal reforms. We have seen them in Sweden. Britain is an outstanding example of uh, uh, legislation that making it more difficult for the trade unions. We've seen it here in Sweden. Mm -hmm. But I also want to add that that's not the only reason why the trade unions are getting weaker. Here in Sweden, the, the LO is called the uh, strongest trade union of the world, but it has lost half a million members uh, since the year of 2000. And why is that? It's not only because of uh, neoliberalis neoliberalization and globalization and, and, and politics. It's also because they have failed to modernize their own work. Uh, some people call the trade unions male, stale, and pale. And, and in some way, that is true. <laughs> Uh, because the, the trade unions have grown strong uh, in, while industrialization has progressed and have organized their, uh, their work around big workplaces. Uh, and today, because of the globalization and the, the, the changing that you have highlighted, we have more small 
workplaces, more, uh, more work at night, more temporary work. So it's really difficult to organize, much more difficult. So that is one explanation. But that doesn't mean that it is impossible. When I uh, were making interviews uh, for my book, uh, I uh, interviewed a campaign in, in London called Justice for Cleaners. They go out at every hour to, to talk to cleaning workers, to organize them. And I talked to one of the women uh, in the campaign uh, only a week ago. And, and she told me that today the campaign is growing very fast because there's so much migration because of the, the crisis in the EU. So many uh, Latin workers coming from Spain to London. And when they go out, and, 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 and she said, well, they talk so much about social media and, and the Twitter and the Facebook and everything, but you know, uh, these people, they, don't, they know nothing about their rights, and, and some people don't even know how to read. So we go out there, we talk, we have a leaflet and put it in their hand on their own language. And we talk to them about workers' rights, and everyone, understand as we stand there and talk that it's crucial to organize and we get so many members. So this campaign is part of the trade union called Unite and it's one of the few examples today of a trade union growing in Europe because they understand that what they have to do is reach to this <coughs> growing uh, group. And. Uh, Another thing I, I, I wanted to, to comment is that it's also crucial that we, we see uh, that there is a growing demand of the women migrants that uh, Helma was talking about. And uh, the exploitation of, of the women is kind of hidden uh, when, when uh, we have this um, conception that uh, the migrants coming here, if we compare uh, the situation in her country, what she gets here, well, this little, little salary that I pay her uh, for cleaning my home, if I do that, uh, it would be a very little salary for me or for my sister, but for her, comparing to her country, it's so good. So I'm actually a good person giving her this high salary. And it, this is not only taking place in, in the domestic work, it's also taking place in uh, restaurants and everything. So there is a, a demand for migration because the employers, they don't want to be bad people saying to themselves, I'm a bad person, I pay a lousy wage. So they want to say to themselves, I'm a good person, I pay a good salary for this person. But uh, that's, <laughs> for me, that's only crap because you can't say what's good for one person is bad for another. So I think that is one of the one of the things we have to, to, to question. And also, the, it was really interesting for me to, to hear this uh, conception that workers are, are not so free that uh, they, they want to, to tell us. And one aspect of this that will be more and more important the coming years, I think, is the climate changes that forces uh, so many people to migrate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, we will come back to, to uh, what you said later on. And the last commentator, Lisa, you are also a researcher at the Vienna in University and an expert of uh, circular migration. And in Sweden, there is, for the moment, uh, preparing a new law on circular migration. Uh, I don't know if you, can, uh, if you can comment anything on that or what you would focus your comments on. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you all of you for, for, for coming. It's really great to have uh, such a large audience on a, on a, on a free Saturday. Um, uh, as a think tank, we try to combine doing research and a lot of thinking, as you should in a think tank, and, and, and also actually producing proposals and, and ideas for, for change. And, and since we've had a lot of thinkers, I'd, I'd like to focus on, on what we would be proposing and, and 
I would like to focus on the new rules for labor immigration that, that uh, Judy, you, you made a really excellent um, presentation of, of the current situation in Sweden when it comes to the new rules for labor immigration that were introduced in December 2008. So, so what, are the, what are the problems? Well, obviously one fundamental problem is the lack of controls, and, and you mentioned it. Uh, Employers can write, you know, they need to write, I'm offering this person a job with a salary that is on the same level as those agreed in collective agreements in this particular part of the economy. But there is no way of controlling that this salary is actually paid out. And this is scandalous and it has to change. And the trade unions have made very detailed proposal as to how this should happen. An obvious thing with a, in Sweden that has such a, a, a good administrative tax system is just to look into the tax register. Have the taxes been paid that should have been paid if this salary that was promised in the job offer has actually been paid? Not even this control is made, and it could be made. So th these are first basic steps, and, and the trade unions have, have made excellent proposals. Unless... Um, uh, and, and an issue that ex received a little less attention, I think, and, and we, uh, where we as Global Youth Morning have tried to, to start a debate, is the fact that with the new legislation for labour immigration that was introduced in 2008, Sweden actually abolished the possibility for permanent labour immigration. So what we did is we opened one door for all labour immigration immigrants. We did not, we do no longer distinguish between uh, very temporary or seasonal workers and permanent workers. But what happened in the process was that there is no, there is no longer a possibility to receive a permanent residence permit on basis of your work permit when you enter. So all, even if you have a permanent job offer, if a, there's an employer in Sweden who says, I'd like to employ you, I give you a permanent job offer, fast anställning, you still receive only a temporary work permit. It's limited to maximum two years. After two years, you can renew it for another two years. And after that, you have a possibility to apply for a permanent residence permit. <laughs> What we discovered when we looked into the statistics, and I was happy to find that, that the statistics have found your way into your paper, so we're making some, you know, probably we're having some impact, at least in academic circles, is that we found that when we looked at the first generation of labor immigrants, so the ones that came in 2009, the first year with this new legislation, was that only 15%, two years later, had managed to renew their uh, permanent, their, their uh, um, residence permit. So there's 85% of those that came, came only temporary. You can explain it with the fact that some of them were people that before the change of legislation would have come as seasonal workers, like the berry pickers. Nobody, nobody is, is uh, uh, maybe surprised that berry pickers that come for three months in summer do not, you know, are not in the system anymore two years later. But, but uh, for a lot of other people, it seems that the system is making it very difficult to renew your, your temporary permit into a permanent permit. What, what, what does it, how does it matter? Well, there is nothing that contributes more to the vulnerability of a migrant workers than the threat of expulsion. You know, when you know that if you don't do what your employer is telling you, even when the employers say, well, I want you to work more hours for less pay, it's a threat that the employer will say, well, if that's not fine for you, you can go. I withdraw your work permit and bye-bye. The best insurance against this kind of abuse is you have access to a permanent residence permit because if this one employer mistreats you, you can look for another employer. In the system, you have a possibility to be unemployed for three months. So it's, it's not, you know, you, you, there is a theoretic possibility that you can be unemployed for three months and look for another. But still, the right to have a permanent residence permit is, is restricted and I think should find its way into your paper that you can you are entitled uh, to have a permanent residence when you have worked for four years, but this work for four years has to happen within five years. So if you're a berry picker and you come to Sweden every summer for 10 years, you still do not have the right to apply for a permanent residence. So you might have based your entire life on a possibility to every year come to Sweden, say construction workers, you work five months every 
uh, year in Sweden and that's how you earn your income, that's how you pay your rent in, in Ukraine or in Thailand. And of course, you know, an employer can make use of the fact that you need to come back every year and, and, and make use of the fact that you're, you're actually dependent on this job offer coming from him or her uh, to, to have this job. So this, this is a, a thing that we try to bring attention to. If, if there are changes to be made to this legislation, um, definitely they should be making it more easy to get a, a permanent residence permit. Just very shortly, two, two arguments why, why this is urgent, why this is so important. One is that what, what you mentioned, Rebecca, and what you write about in your book as well, is the fact that as long as we have a system that creates submissive, easily exploitable, badly paid workers on a labor market, that makes it possible for normal families, quite normal families, to have somebody else clean their toilets. You know, they will keep demanding this kind of service. You know, this, this will be a normal thing to do in a normal upper middle class home. Kids will learn cleaning your toilet is something that somebody else would do. And you would create exactly this segmented labor market that we do not want to have and the kind of segmented society that we do not have, want to have. Also, we are, of course, and this argument has been said many other times, what we are doing is that we are replacing couples sharing responsibilities and families sharing responsibilities for cleaning toilets with having a Filipino woman taking care of that while she has to leave her family back home in the Philippines. It's not a system we want to have. It's not something that we want to get dependent on. It's very urgent that we, we, we act. And other issue with the issue of, of having the difference between permanent and temporary worker permits is, of course, that we have a permanent need for migration. There is no way of fooling us. You know, there is no way of saying Sweden would need workers for the coming two years. So let's just give people two-year permits. You know, in, in this book that we have written about um, European uh, migration policy, what we are saying is uh, everybody knows demography. We are a shrinking, aging population. We will need migration for the decades to come. You know, let's accept the fact that, you know, we, we could fill this permanent need for migration with temporary migrant workers. But, you know, we, we create societies that we do not want to have on the way. So it's really time to focus on the permanency. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. I can see that some of the former speakers were nodding uh, vigorously. <laughs> and uh, does that mean, Judy, that you want to reflect on, on what has been said here uh, the last minutes? Or is any in of... In yes? Yeah, but, but would you wait for the uh, micro? It's just coming with Veronica, yes, I think so. So, Stephen. Okay. Just on the issue of having Filipino cleaners, I mean, of course, sorry. Um, I mean, at the moment, Filipino cleaners come not only because we want them, but because they have no livelihood in the Philippines. So, the real issue is how do we support social reform in the Philippines? And, I mean, the Philippines is a very interesting case because it has enormous emigration. And it was started by the Marcos dictatorship as a deliberate strategy to get rid of people who were troublemakers, in other words, people who wanted change, and to avoid any reform. And successive regimes in the Philippines, supposedly democratic regimes, have um, insisted that it's good for the Philippines to be the exporter of workers for the world. And every regime, be it Aquino or Arroyo or, you know, all the presidents have avoided a land reform for a simple reason, that they are all part of the oligarchy that owns the land. So, you know, the, the, the issue is not, I mean, if we stop employing Filipino cleaners at the moment, we're depriving a family of a livelihood. The issue is how, for instance, can the Swedish labor movement support movements for change in the Philippines and in similar countries? Thank you, Stephen. Do you want to, to comment on that, Lisa? Yes? It, it, it's very important, of course, that, that I don't get misunderstood as, as, as meaning we should not have Filipino women coming uh, to work in Sweden. It, it, it's, it's, that's a different issue. You know, I, I'm in favor of labor immigration, only the, the ones that come, they should have a decent pay. If they have a decent pay, families cannot afford 
to pay decently for somebody cleaning a toilet. It's it's not it's not uh, it's not possible. That's the kind of work that you should share within the family, and and we should not build a labor market that builds on the fact that two full working um, uh, people have no time to do this basic kind of services at home. What we are doing now is we're replacing a more equal distribution of of domestic tasks with having people coming in doing this for for slave uh, salaries. Now, I, I think a conclusion cannot be to stop labor immigration, but a conclusion would be, as, as you said, to make sure that people that come have decent conditions, decent pay, and that they are they are they get the possibility to be organized. Thank you. Rebecca, you would like to comment as well? Yes. Uh, I was thinking about, I sat down uh, a few days ago with two women working in the elderly care in, in here in, in Stockholm. One from Ethiopia, she lives here, she has two children back in Ethiopia, and another woman from India. And, and they are migrants, but they have legal status, and they also have been here so long, so they have Swedish nationality. But still, they were talking about different rights on their workplace uh, between the, them and, and the Swedes. They were talking, one of them, she said she was working for five years uh, before she got a permanent job on this place. The other one was, uh, they have another example, another woman from Bangladesh, she worked seven years without a permanent job, and they say, you have, your name has to be Svensson or Bengtsson, typical Swedes name, to get the permanent job here. So I ask them, but uh, that, that, that's not legal to, to have different, uh, um, different uh, treatment because of, of your ethnicity. So, so what, what does the trade union do? What do, 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 what do you do your, yourselves? And they say, no, the trade union representative, she's the closest friend to the boss. So pff, no, uh, we, we don't like the, the trade union. But I said, well, that's also your fault because you have to, yeah, there is n no such thing that legal rights if you're not there yourself to defend it. So every, every person have to uh, take on the information about their rights. The trade unions have the, the duty to inform, but then also everyone have the duty to stand up for their rights, to organize and to, 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 to change. Because what we were talking about later, that the, the legal rights the, of, the, the, the work, of work and of civil society, that is changing and it's changing due to struggle. And what we also were talking about is that the, the Swedish model that we have no minimum wage, that means that it's legal to pay one crown per hour or something like, or, or, or don't pay at all, it's legal. Uh, nothing you could do about it. Well, there is, because you can always do trade union blockades. Uh, so to, to, to fight for a change. And that, that what's uh, made the salaries uh, uh, in Sweden higher than in, in other European countries. But that depend on that we have, we talk about this, that uh, the, the, the trade unions are the key to decent salaries and everybody have to, 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 to be a member uh, and to fight for it. Thank you, very, uh, thank you very much. It would be interesting to hear if there is anybody from the trade unions in this room or on the web today to uh, comment on what we have heard about the lack of uh, activity or the lack of uh, uh, what, what, what the trade unions are doing for the migrant workers. Is there anybody from a trade union here in the room? Or is there anybody who could like to speak on behalf of the trade unions? No. <laughs> that was a pity. We should have had somebody from, uh, from some of the big units. Say, Judy. Hello. I can't, I really, thank you for the comments. They were really great comments. The hard questions about human rights and really good detail and helpful. In Canada, a union that was actually a kind of business union and kind of in bed with the boss that organized big grocery stores and really discriminated against women started losing all its members because of Walmart coming in and Walmart fighting unions. And this union started organizing migrant farm workers because it thought we have blown what we had. 
And what we need to do is we need to restart. And we need to restart with food because food is central. And we need to start from the bottom up. And what was a bad union now is doing really good things and really fighting hard and setting up community organizing. And it wasn't because they all of a sudden woke up and became good. They woke up all of a sudden and realized, if we don't, we're dead. So they had a strategic plan before they were so weak that they couldn't do anything. So I don't think that the Swedish labor movement will have huge problems in five years, but there is a secular decline in density and it's particularly steep in the private service sector. And unless unions do something about it, we will have a generation of migrant workers, young people, and old people who are going to be doing bad jobs, who won't feel any solidarity. So I think unions will learn to do good things because they will have no option. Thank you very much. I hope that there will be somebody who can actually send this message to the labor unions who are not here today. We will just have one more comment from, uh, uh, from the speakers here, Helma. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I um, think we also have to talk about the dilemmas here, right? And the dilemma is actually that the trade unions are not just organizing uh, male, pale, and stale, but organizing national workers and national citizens. So uh, it's, um, and the, the idea of the established trade unions is that we have to protect our members and especially this group. So uh, it's a real challenge. Um, and we were talking uh, also about this in, in um, uh, just uh, with the coffee that um, uh, actually the, 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 the the, the idea about these uh, people coming in and doing this kind of work is actually that, that they uh, cause uh, so, uh, um, wage dumping, right? So, um, and when we look at the European situation at the moment, we have some countries where, uh, or many countries where we have side by side uh, professional services, and these, and there are actually trade unions taking care of, of their needs, and we have undeclared workers, and um, and uh, also there is the idea of the unions that they do not want to stand up for undeclared workers, right? So this this is a dilemma, I think. And uh, at the same time, I think one of the uh, causes for that is that unions are so much focused on the national, um, um, on on the nation as such, and and not so much. Um, really looking at the world, how it is developing, and that we are that we have uh, transnational um, um, ideas, and and there there is a need for really unions looking at these uh, uh, transnational movements. And just a short comment, I I think uh, I, uh, this was fantastic uh, what you said about this, uh, the the question of what do we teach to the next um, generation. Uh, one of um, and uh, my colleagues uh, um, from Poland just told me a, a couple of weeks ago that uh, in a playground she was with her child and, and, and then another child of five years came up to her, a German child, and said, what language are you speaking with each other? And she said, Polish. And this young boy said, oh, my cleaner is also Polish. <laughs> So that tells you something about what you know the child learned from the fact that uh, there is a Polish cleaner in the house. Thank you very much. You can give the microphone to Veronica. We had a, a comment here in the middle. If you would be so kind to state your name and if you represent an organization. Uh, my name is Ingmar Dahlqvist and uh, uh, I asked for the word since uh, I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, and I have been working in trade union magazines uh, for many years before I became a freelancer. But uh, I refuse to speak on behalf of the trade unions. <laughs> uh, but uh, <clears throat> I think it's quite a negative picture that uh, we are painting here on uh, about the trade unions uh, in Sweden and globally. 
uh, I think they are, uh, there are a lot of strong forces in, in the trade unions who are trying to meet the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the new uh, questions from the globalizations and so on. And I've been working <coughs> with research for the Swedish uh, ELO, uh, the <coughs> Trade Union Confederation, uh, with doing a lot of research about the <coughs> workers coming from, e from Eastern Europe to Sweden to work in the construction sector. Uh, so I, th I think there are initiatives and <laughs> the, the picture is not all bad. Uh, but uh, as we have heard from other speakers here, yes, the trade unions are also suffering from uh, different problems like uh, the governmental uh, politics and so on. And that's uh, maybe why they are not so active. <coughs> I know that, uh, for example, the construction workers uh, union in Sweden, they have had to cut down about 50% of their workforce. Uh, the last five or six years or so, uh, and that is of course a problem for them. But uh, I agree um, with a lot of the criticism too against the trade unions. They have to be m much more active in organizing. Uh, I think they have forgot that depending a lot of the uh, the state, the help from the, from the government and legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I come to think of the word solidarity when, when we uh, discuss. Maybe it's time to take the dust away from this word that has not been used for the last decades, more or less, uh, the, the word solidarity. We have another uh, comment here from Stephen. Yeah. Um, it, it's really about destroying a unionized workforce, you know, by employing people as, in, as casuals, as temporaries, as subcontractors. It's all about stopping people being represented by the unions. I mean, particularly subcontractors, turning building workers into theoretically small independent entrepreneurs is about weakening the union. And the problem is that the unions and I'm not talking about Sweden, I don't know about Sweden, but this is a global problem. The unions on the whole haven't known what to do. They've tried to defend their old way of working and the workers who are still in the union, but they haven't realized that that is getting squeezed all the time. And really the only solution of, for unions is to try new political strategies, new organizing strategies, and to reach out to workers who up to now have not been part of the union, especially irregular workers, migrant workers, even subcontractors are not real entrepreneurs. They are really workers who are being forced into this position. So we have the idea that unions need to work much more with social movements. And uh, you know, the, the old, w the, the way of working that trade unions have developed over 100 years has been shattered by neoliberalism and if they don't change, they will get marginalized. Thank you, uh, thank you Stephen. The, the, the debate has focused very much on the labor unions now. Uh, we have two more comments uh, on this, and then maybe we could take up an, another subject. Rebecca, the microphone. Yes, uh, you said you don't know about how it was in Sweden. It's exactly the same here. When the, the right-wing government came to uh, came in government, one of the first things, they made it easier for uh, single persons to be an ent entrepreneur. So, so, so that's uh, one of the aspects of the neoliberalization neoliber here. Uh, but I think, as we say, that the, the trade unions are doing a lot of good job. I agree. Uh, but I still think that we need to uh, go on criticizing that it's crucial to do to do better off because we we must see that it's going downhill right now the the gap between the rich and the poor is increasing also here in Sweden and we could say uh, 10 years ago the the head econom of the LO uh, Don Andersson was writing an afterword on the famous book of Barbara Ehrenreich in Sweden it's called Barsgrapar, I don't know in English. Nickel and Dime. Yes. 
So, and he wrote, uh, co comparing the situation in the States with Sweden, and, and, and he wrote, well, there's uh, one uh, important aspect of difference, because here we have the, the collective uh, agreement that leaves no one beside. So we have a higher level. But that was 10 years ago. Look today on service sector, one-fifth of service sector in Sweden, with the strongest union of the world, is uh, outside this, and you have no collective agreements. So the, the only way to get it is the, the trade union struggle. And it's not easy, but <laughs> it's, the, it's the only way. Do you, th do you think, like in many other European countries, that there is a legislation instead of collective agreement? No. That's not a solution? No, I don't, no, I don't believe in that. I believe in uh, struggle, struggle okay. <laughs> organizing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Raul, you wanted to have the word, so where we do we have the uh, microphone? Well, I, I want to follow uh, what Stephen just mentioned, which I, I think is very relevant. Um, one of the main trends, we have to understand the main trends of how capital is restructuring uh, today and the big, large corporations. And I don't think that, that the, 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 the trade unions are really understanding this process and tackling this process, uh, which has uh, outsourcing, subcontracting chains, which makes very invisible for whom you are working for. Uh, there are some initiatives, but you have to go beyond the nation state, because this is a global strategy and, and, and then I think the alliances with social movements are very, very important and with social movements of different kind like Via Campesina and, uh, and many other movements no, uh, that are all over. So uh, uh, the issue of power and also going to your point is, uh, is, is very crucial. No? If, uh, only the Declaration of Human Rights is just a normative statement, but if you don't have the power <laughs> to make that, uh, uh, concretize that, that then, th then that's um, uh, just uh, uh, something that is written <laughs> and, uh, and has it nothing to do with reality. And one last point. Uh, regarding uh, temporary migration, circular migration, but I, I would like to say it's not exactly the same, that temporary migration uh, programs. And temporary migration programs are, are being uh, like uh, the mainstream policy that is uh, trying to push forward in, in the global, in, in global forum. Uh, so I think we have to be aware not only of the consequences of, 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 of uh, temporary workers program. And um, I have seen many, many reports, and some of them are close to slavery. In Canada, they call them corporate-driven public policy. Uh, so, so I think uh, even like think tanks in Washington, like uh, Migration Policy Institute, and Kathleen Newland that has tried to do a uh, defense of uh, temporary workers programs it hasn't really done much in trying to uh, defend that possibility and, and show it as a triple win process. Thank you very much. And, and uh, Hans Ingmar, you wanted to have the word uh, as well. Uh, I just want to uh, tag on to what Raul just said here that um, uh, I think also that the, the buzzwords and the rhetoric, uh, for example, saying that we want flexible, open, dynamic markets, the, this rhetoric can be very much misused. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned here, this temporary employment program, they are, um, I, um, they are implemented in order to try to uh, fulfill these nice uh, objectives, flexibility, dynamics, etc., dynamic workforce. Uh, so we should also be very, very much aware about the rhetoric here and, and how the neoliberal paradigm um, uh, so to speak, use this rhetoric and become more deeply entrenched in the globalized uh, um, labor market. And uh, I also think it's very important to really, well, of course, trade unions are very, very important. But we, as you said, we also need 
to include a lot of participants in uh, civil society, churches for example. Uh, a lot of associations are needed in order to make the situation better for vulnerable migrants. So, um, uh, trade unions, uh, yes, but also in coalition with other groups. And I uh, hear the human rights framework, as it has been uh, uh, implemented through United Nations in, in, concerning several vulnerable groups, is really uh, the positive alternative to this ne neoliberal uh, paradigm. It's here we should find our alternative vision. Thank you, Hans Ingvar. Uh, the clock is ticking, <laughs> and uh, if there is if there is any more comments from the audience, we will take one last comment or questions. Yes, Kenneth, if you wait for the microphone. Um, uh, Kenneth Abramson from FAS. Well, I think the point made by Hans Ingvar. Uh, also is, is well taken and maybe one should go into that a little more, namely the issue of xenophobia, of tolerance uh, and it's not only that you can regulate by, by saying that the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, uh, is also how things are in practice and uh, if we take examples uh, from uh, different uh, European countries, we could take Sweden but we could also take Finland the, the, the true Finns uh, um, many who votes for them uh, belong to, to trade unions, to, to uh, 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 other kind of workers. So you have this this issue: how you how you could uh, uh, have uh, some kind of learning process for a more open society. Uh, and uh, it seems to me maybe that you, you, the uh, old uh, iron curtain between the West and uh, uh, East is now replaced by some kind of religious curtain, and as you had a book on uh, religion as uh, human rights, is th this I think is a, is a challenge also for research to look into these issues, how, how people relate to each other and how we could create a more common world. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, as a very last uh, comment, I would just say myself, because the, the, now it's almost four o'clock, uh, after all these um, interesting speeches and interesting comments, I would just like to say this is not a national problem. This is not a problem for the receiving countries. It's also a problem, if we would want, want to call it a problem, for the countries where the migrants are leaving, so they are both immigrants and emigrants at the same time. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Belgian government, uh, the foreign minister of uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, did a report where they were going to list the most uh, sort of important security problems for the security of the country. At the top of the list was immigrants, migrations, because they said it, w it would cause xenophobia, it would cause unrest, it would cause conflicts. But that is not the right way to look upon it only to see that this is a conflict that has to be solved by, for instance, the labor unions. It is a problem that has to be solved by everybody, not only the labor unions and the church and, and the civil society, but also by the politicians and also by uh, people actually working in the society. This is just a few remarks at the end of a, a very interesting seminar. And I think this is a start for many of us, perhaps, to, uh, to start engaging ourselves a bit more in this, uh, in this issue. I will give the word to Carl Ulrich as the very last word for, to, to, for today. Thank you very much. It was not on. OK. Uh, thank you so much for this honor. Uh, let me just. Uh, put a very short remark on Hans Ingmar's um, statement, last statement. Uh, what uh, is suggested here is already taking place, and it's taken place in Italy, for example, for a long time, uh, and resulted in, for example, that domestic workers in Italy are among the first, many women, and best organized in that country. Uh, but it's also taking place on a global scale, uh, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, let me just also take the opportunity to uh, inform that there's rich material already available on our remesso 
just write a message on Google homepage, which will be even richer in some weeks uh, from the conference, both from scholars and from civil society participants. Well, there's one good reason that uh, such meetings as this one and our uh, meeting in um, uh, No Shipping, uh, the three um, days before, uh, are becoming uh, especially important. Uh, apart from the very, in, <laughs> I mean, intrinsic problems that we have been discussing here, and that is that Sweden is actually taking over uh, from 2013 uh, the chair for uh, one of the most important uh, processes uh, concerning the development of an integrated uh, global uh, of deliberation concerning the possibility of setting up uh, standards for uh, global governance of migration. Eva Aukerman Burr will know a lot about that, could tell us a lot about that. <laughs> so, um, it was a process uh, started by, with a high-level uh, UN dialogue in 2006 on migration and development, and it has got, been going on in different states since that within the forum called the Global Forum for Migration and Development. Uh, but there's also an, a parallel process. States, in connection with each meeting of the Global Forum for Migration and Development, which is a forum for uh, deliberation between governments set up uh, both within a certain space for civil society within that global forum each year, but also as a parallel event uh, that is set out, up um, in uh, as an autonomous uh, meeting uh, in conjunction with these government meetings each year, and which is uh, doing, having uh, quite a success in feeding into uh, what is called the civil society space within these forums. Um, so uh, I was, uh, the first time I visited uh, this kind of parallel meetings, but also the global forum was in Mexico City in 2010, and, and the, the, the civil society autonomous meeting was a very serious thing. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, forming a platform from about 1,000 delegates uh, from uh, Margan organization, Margan advocacy organizations, faith organizations, and even trade unions from all across the world. And uh, it was not only a very powerful forum for, for uh, forging a framework of organization and alliance building uh, uh, between different, uh, very broad set of, 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 of uh, civil society organizations, but it was also uh, a very serious uh, setting for the production of high quality knowledge. Uh, and on this basis, uh, the forming, the, the putting forward of evidence-based claims. So, one of the most essential goals of those efforts uh, of uh, the so-called uh, global, no, global people's action on migration, development, and human rights was exactly to extend the focus or uh, the, 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 the realm of these government forums, that was a wish, uh, to also include uh, human rights uh, besides migration and development. Uh, but there is, uh, today it appears to me, that's a certain uh, sense of de uh, deception or, or uh, being well, well, uh, uh, weariness, uh, a feeling um, that uh, civil society is not really given the uh, extent, the, the, the space promised to it in a, in a genuine dialogue uh, within these important fora. Uh, and therefore, actually, it was very promising that, that we had the opportunity to have Eva uh, Okerman Börje as a guest uh, in our conference uh, yesterday uh, as a rep representative for the Swedish Ministry of Justice, uh, uh, participating in, it was quite short, but a dialogue with one of the most important uh, people who have been organizing uh, the civil society um, meetings and the participation in these previous global fora. And what was so promising was that actually you, Eva, ha uh, expressed the intention to, to make uh, the 
uh, Swedish uh, chairmanship, we will chair uh, the Global Forum for Migration and Development in 2014 here in Stockholm, uh, and more uh, to make for a more genuine space, perhaps, as well, what I understood, for a genuine dialogue between civil society and uh, governments on an emerging, maybe, global governance on migration with more fair standards that is that are perhaps today. I don't know if you, <laughs> there's a po possibility or anything that you say something about that. Thank you. Uh, just before closing, um, I would thank you so much, and especially the panelists coming from Australia, from Vancouver Island, from from Germany and uh, from all over the world, from Mexico, uh, and uh, all, all you. And especially thank also to Eva Hedlund, who has been moderating it, uh, and to good uh, collaboration with the Global Challenge. It's always a challenge to, to work with Global Challenge, but <laughs> I think that we managed uh, to do that. And also, as seen from FIS and from the Swedish MOST Committee, I think this is also a challenge to see what we could provide for research policy studies in the ongoing debate that uh, that uh, Kalish Europe recently has pointed out. So if I now say go out in the Swedish summer, <laughs> I, I'm not so certain if that will warm you up. But I think if you move a little, your bodies, you will be more, and you have your enthusiasm, your energy, and your inspiration. So thank you so much, and especially to Eva.